Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Caitlin Edwards and I'm the manager of community events here at Linux Professional Institute. LPI is the global certification standard and career support organization for open source professionals. With more than 175,000 certification holders, it's the world's first and largest vendor neutral Linux and open source certification body. LPI has certified professionals in over 180 countries, deliver ex delivers exams in multiple languages, and has hundreds of training partners. Thanks for joining us and the community at today's LPIC 1 preparation webinar. Participating in this webinar, you'll learn more about the understanding the objectives uh, prior to taking your exam. Uh, take, we'll take a deeper dive into the exam structure and uh, we'll learn a little bit more of why obtaining your certification is professionally beneficial. During the webinar, please feel free to write any questions that you have in the chat box or the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen there. I'll keep track of that and facilitate Q&A throughout the webinar. The Linux Professional Institute LPIC 1 Preparation Webinar will be led by our training advisor, uh, Kenny Armstrong from Linux Professional Institute. Kenny has worked with uh, Unix-like operating systems since his introduction to them while serving in the U.S. military in the late, in the late 1990s. Kenny has been involved with the Linux community in various ca uh, capacities, such as teaching Linux for a variety of training organizations, deploying Linux in local government institutions up to large universities, as well as various large-scale businesses. Kenny enjoys working with open platforms and, provide, and finding potential new uses for them in a variety of situations. More importantly, he prefers teaching them others about Linux and how they can use uh, use Linux whenever possible. Kenny, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you, Caitlin. Well, hello, everybody. I hope the day is finding everybody well. Uh, there's quite a bit of ground to cover, so I'm going to talk rather quickly, but uh, we're going to try and get through as much as we can. And as Caitlin said, uh, at any point in time, just go ahead and fire in a question, and then uh, we can go ahead and take it from there. So we're going to start off by going over some background about the Linux Professional Institute. And then we're going to discuss uh, which exams that the Linux Professional Institute offers and how do you prepare for an LPI exam, what you should expect while you're actually taking an exam, and once you have, a compl once you have completed the exam, what, what happens next. So first off, hints on exam preparation and exam strategies are the speaker's personal opinions. So basically anything that I say is just from my own experiences. I don't speak for everybody at large. Uh, this is just what I've come, come into contact with and just, uh, you know, I might pass off some helpful hints, but obviously I can't provide like any kind of details for answers or things like that. Uh, LPI test your knowledge and not how you obtained it. And basically what that boils down to is they don't really, it doesn't matter how you've gotten your information, whether it be through YouTube videos, through your own personal training, from college courses, from, uh, from courses that you pay for online. Just basically they want to see that you know the objectives that they are, are expecting to test you on. So just use your own judgment on how to prepare. So just do your own background research on any of the training materials that you get your hands on to make sure that you feel that you're getting something from a reputable vendor or that the author has received good reviews for a book that they have written, things of that nature. So what is the Linux Professional Institute and how can you benefit from getting certified through them? So Linux Professional Institute, often just the acronym is LPI for short, the main mission is that they provide the use of open source by elevating the people who work with it. So not only is it just Linux, it's about the whole gamut of the open source ecosystem. That includes projects that come out of Apache, that includes the BSDs, which we're going to have some certifications for coming up soon. Uh, just about anything that revolves around open source, LPI has, has the sole mission of helping to promote the usage and the adoption of it. They are a nonprofit organization. They are headquartered in Canada. They also have, as Caitlin said earlier, they have regional partners providing local support around the world. That's Japan, Germany, Brazil, the United States, Canada, just throughout the whole globe. And there's also some independent, uh, they are independent from vendors in Linux distributions, meaning that unlike the Red Hat certification courses, which obviously gear themselves towards Red Hat, LPI will test you on Red Hat knowledge, but they also cover the gamut of other items such as what you can find under uh, such as Debian-based systems, then that includes Ubuntu, Linux Mint, so on and so forth, and up through some instances of like Slackware and things like that. 
Uh, this is a slightly older graphic. The numbers were a bit higher than that, but uh, this is this done. There were over 165,000 LPI certified professionals with well over half a million total exams given with 180 plus countries with LPI certified IT professionals, 25 regional offices, and exam has been offered in nine different languages. So what are some of the benefits that you can get from the LPI exam? Well, the exams, their certifications encompass numerous qualifications and skills. They affirm professional competencies as well as engagement and continuing education. They want to make sure that you're keeping up with some of the newer technologies that are coming out. The exams represent a common standard in both content and quality, but they're not a comprehensive professional qualification on its own, but it is the best unique and distinguishing credential. An LPI certification is globally recognized and highly reputable. It's recognized by other certification vendors, and it's often a prerequisite for other exams. For instance, there are some Microsoft certifications that would require an LPI type certification prior, prior to going up further for some of the other cloud systems like Azure and things like that. There are multiple options for study materials and training, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail here in a bit. And like I said earlier, there is no requirement whatsoever to participate in specific training, courses, books, seminars, anything like that. Basically, they're just testing to see that you know what the exam objectives are, and that's the extent of it. So which exams and certifications do exist? This is a nice little chart that we've had drawn up where kind of show the breakdown and the hierarchy of the uh, various exams. Over here on the far left is the, but the build confidence category, the Linux essentials. It's not a prerequisite for any of the other exams that are listed here, but it's basically a nice way to say that, yes, I do understand what Linux is. I do know how to write some simple scripts on Linux. I can operate a Linux system, and I know some history about Linux in general. Uh, it's a pretty simple test, and we'll go into some of the details about these other tests as we go along the lines. But again, like I said, it's not, it's not exactly a professional certif uh, certification. It's just more of a standalone certificate of itself. The actual professional certification track is what you see to the right of the dashed line, which, be which begins with the LPIC-1, the Linux System Administrator. And, it, and then from there, you can go to the LPIC-2, which is the Linux Engineer. And then once you go past that, you can get any one of the particular specialties of the LPIC-3 level, such as Enterprise Professional Mixed Environment, Enterprise Professional Security, and Enterprise Professional Virtualization and HA. You can get either one of those, or you could do all three, depending on how you wish to uh, approach your, your certification path. But the, uh, once you get one of the LPIC-3 certifications, whether it be security, mixed environment, or, or HA, you are considered LPIC-3 certified. And branching off of LPIC-1, if you don't wish to go straight through a Linux engineer path, there is also another certification for the DevOps tools and engineer. That's where you get into things such as Ansible, Chef, Puppet, uh, Jenkins, things like that, where there is a large gamut of different types of technologies that you need to understand how to use and deploy for continuous delivery and continuous integration environments. A little bit more details about these individual certificates. Linux Essentials, like I said, is entry level. It, there is no prerequisite to take it, and it's not a prerequisite to anything else. There is only one single exam for it, and that is the Linux Essentials 010 exam. It's the shortest of all of them. It's only 60 minutes. There's only 40 questions on the exam. And like I said before, it's separate from the other, se it's separate from the other LPIC certifications where, like I said, it's just a standalone professional, I mean, non-professional certificate on its own. The DevOps tools engineer is just the tools and the technology. Prerequisite none, even though it is requested that you have at least an LPIC-1 or equivalent experience in order to understand the concepts and tools that are covered under the DevOps Tools Engineer exam. And the exam for that one is the 701 series. LPIC-1, which is the most popular one that Linux has, uh, Linux Professional Institute has at this time, is level one Linux certi certification. Basically, you need to know the local system itself, how to get it on the network, but how the internals of the system operate how you can deal with different types of software, different types of distributions, how to manage the configuration files for different services. It's your, your standalone Linux system administrator. Uh, again, there are no prerequisites for it. And there are two separate exams for this one, the LPIC 101 and the LPIC 102. You do not have to take either one of those in, 
in that particular order. You could do 102 before you take the 101. It doesn't matter. As long as you pass both exams within a five-year period, then you can become LPIC-1 certified. LPIC-2 is the Linux engineer. This is where you're taking the Linux system that you have experience with from LPIC-1 and getting it onto a network on a multi-node system. So you need to know the different networking protocols, how to work with different types of networking technology, such as web servers, file servers, DNS servers, mail servers, things like that. And it gets into more advanced system topics, such as kernel configuration, building kernels, uh, dealing with kernel modules at a deeper level, things like that. The prerequisite for the LPIC2 is you need to have an active LPIC1. And I do have friends I've gone and staffed for the LPIC2 before, without taking the LPIC-1, but they're not actually considered LPIC-2 certified until they go back and take the LPIC-1 exam. So you can get the sort of, sort of uh, sorry, the cert certification itself, but you're not actually considered an active certified LPIC-2 unless you have both the LPIC-1 and the LPIC-2 together at the same time. There's two separate, ex two separate exams for this one, the LPIC-201 and the LPIC-202. And like before, we discussed the LPIC-3. This is the senior level Linux certification. Requisite, just as with the LPIC-2, you need an active LPIC-1. For LPIC-3, you need an, an active LPIC-2 certification. You can take either one of these. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you pass one of them, you are considered LPIC level 3. The 300 is the mixed environment. The 303 exam covers security. And the 304 covers high availability and virtualization. So what are some ways that you could prepare for an LPI exam? Each exam, aside from the Linux Essentials one, is 90 minutes long with 60 questions. And again, that covers the LPIC exams and the DevOps exams. 60 minutes and 40 questions for the Essentials exam. They are all multiple choice. Each one gives four or five different answers. And you will have to choose the one correct answer unless another number is explicitly requested in the question. It won't just say, choose any number or some mixed, vague verbology like that. It's going to say, select one answer, or it'll say, select two or select three, just whatever the case may be. So it will tell you exactly which number that is, it is looking for in order to be a correct answer. There are some fill-in-the-blank questions. They have free text. For example, they are looking for a command, a parameter, a configuration option, a path to a file or a directory, a file name, things like that and only one correct response is required. So I would like to elaborate on this part right here. When it comes to the fill in the blank questions, make sure that you read that question carefully. If it's saying it only wants an option, don't give the command plus the option, just provide just the option by itself. If it's looking for the name of a configuration file, give it just the name. It does not require the full path to that configuration file, just the name. So make sure that you read those particular questions carefully before you type in your answer to make sure that you get correct credit for that question. The OPI exam format, it's all about passing. There is no final grade on the cert certification because nobody knows everything. Let's just be honest. Every single day we learn something new with Linux. That's part of the adventure of Linux. We are always finding out something that we never knew the day before. And the OPI exams understand that concept. But you should at least have a general clue and know those details one stumbles upon in real life. In other words, know that some options, such as a capital letter option A, may be different than what the lowercase, ca uh, the lowercase dash A option would do. So being aware of those, those types of small differences when it comes to a, a command. Scores range from 200 to 800, with 500 as a pass. So as long as you get above a 500, you're good to go. That's considered a pass for that particular exam. The number of correct answers required to pass varies with questions used on the exam because each item has its own difficulty. So when you sit for an exam, it's not going to be, say if you sit for an exam one week and you go for the same exam, exam the following week, you're not going to get the same exact questions. It's going to be random every time you sit down. And each individual question is going to have a separate weight as to how much it is going to count towards your final grade or your final, your, your final score. The exam objectives, which we will look at shortly, they describe the content covered by an exam. They will contain examples of some commands, files, and terms, but examples are only a partial list, and that's something that's very important to keep in mind. wiki.lpi.org or on the main lpi.org website, and we will look at those in a moment. And this is also important. 
double check that you study the most recent version of your exam's objectives. Periodically, LPI will put out a new version of, a, of an exam, and there's going to be a little bit of an overlap where the previous version will still be out there in the wild. That you can still take it, and it still counts as a, uh, as a certification that you can get while the new one takes, takes hold in the market. There's about, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a six-month overlap period for that. Uh, right now for LPIC-1, it's the LPIC-1-500. The dash 400, if I'm not mistaken, is no longer being offered. So that six-month grace period is already come and gone. So when you go to sit for the LPIC-1, make sure that you are studying materials for the dash 500 and not any previous version. That really comes into play, say, if you go to Amazon or a bookstore and you're picking up a book on LPIC-1 study materials, make sure that you're picking up one that is written for the exact version of the exam that you're looking to take. So where to take an LPI exam? We offer paper-based exams at events such as SCALE, which Caitlin and I will be attending this weekend in California, if anybody is going to be nearby, at the uh, Linux Fest in North, uh, Northwest in Washington State next month. We will also be there. CBIT, FOSDEM, FROSCON, uh, that, that runs the gamut. So if, if LPI is at an event, they're likely going to offer a paper-based exam that you can sit for. The difference with the, we're going over some of the differences here in a moment. One of the differences with taking a paper-based exam is that you will not get your results until after four weeks because these have to be hand-graded by the actual graders and not, you're not going to get an immediate result back like you would with a computer-based exam. The good thing about taking a paper exam is that you get a discounted price on sitting for a paper exam when you attend an event. When you take the computer-based exams, you go to a testing center for those. We use Pearson View as our vendor for the, the computer-based exams. So when you go to register for an exam, you just go to view.com slash LPI to fill out the form for your particular exam. And it's going to make sure that you, uh, you're going to need to make sure that you already have an LPI ID before you register for an exam so that this way View knows how to tie those results back to you. In order to get an LPI ID, you just go to the lpi.org website and register for your ID from there. And it takes about 24 hours and you'll receive it within an email. When you set for a computer-based exam, the results are available immediately after the exam is done. So after you click your final review and you're good to go, you're gonna know immediately if you have passed or failed the exam. So what can you expect during an LPI exam? Just like any other test, they can be stressful. Just make sure that you, you're prepared. Just make sure that you study and that you're well-rested. Uh, the jokingly appropriate levels of sugar, caffeine, that just kind of ties into making, making sure that you're well awake. No headache or stomach ache, no tiring medicine. And check it in advance if you need special accessibility arrangements. So check with your testing center to make sure if you need wheelchair access or uh, a different type of computer screen for uh, reduced visibility, things like that. Make sure you go to the restroom beforehand. Because once you leave the room, if you leave the room while you're actually taking the exam, the exam is considered over and that's the end of it. So again, make sure that you're good to go prior to sitting for the exam itself at the testing center. Make sure that you bring an official government issued ID, such as a driver's license or a passport when you go to take the exam. And of course, you're gonna also need your LPI ID number. And again, like I said, you can go to the, you can actually go to this link right here to register to get yourself a, uh, an LPI ID, which you're also going to need when you register for the computer-based exam as well. So during the exam itself, read all questions carefully as possible. Now, gonna, and it basically ties into the next point. LPI does not use trick questions, uh, but there are questions on there that if, you're, if you don't read the wording correctly, if, if you don't, Bring in the proper context. You may you may slip yourself may slip your uh, slip up yourself when it comes to I'm trying to understand what they're getting at. So make sure that you read the question very carefully when you're going to answer any of these questions. When it comes to multiple choice questions, there is always one correct answer unless the question explicitly explicitly requires more than one. And again, it will tell you how many that it is look it is looking for. For the fill in the blank. Watch out for hints such as expecting pass, additional options, or parameters, or not. Again, read those questions carefully. If it's only looking for an option, just put the option. Don't put the full command plus an option. If it only wants a file name, just give just the file name. Don't put in the path. So some best practices, first pass, 
always go low hanging for the easements that you know that you can rattle off the top of your head. Second pass is to begin focusing on the rest, the ones that are going to require a little bit more thought, uh, a little bit more reaching back into your memory to try to figure out how certain things work. And of course, do a control pass for all questions just to make sure that you got everything answered. Uh, don't leave anything unanswered. If you don't know, at least put something. Maybe you'll get lucky and you'll get the right, right answer. Check all questions and answers again. Trust your experience. And two questions is often better than overthinking. If you change anything, be sure you know why. So if you start to question yourself, just make sure you have a good idea as to why you're changing a particular answer. And like I said, don't leave anything unanswered. Unanswered questions will be marked as incorrect. But if you just take a guess, maybe you'll hit bullseye and get the right one. So uncertainties during the exam, they, we do our best to ensure that this doesn't happen, making sure that the, the systems are up, making sure everything, the connectivity to the exam servers are good to go. Very carefully read the questions again. Proctors are not allowed to talk about exam content. My experience, most of them have no idea what you're sitting for. Uh, most of these testing centers, they, they cover test, uh, testing at certifications for nurses, for, for contractors, for, for plumbers. They, they, if there's just too many different vendors there. They really don't know what you're sitting for, so they're not going to be able to help you anyway. Leave a note on the paper provided. LPI checks for comments. Usually it's not paper when I go to testing centers. I find they give you like those little dry erase boards. So hand that back to the proctor when you're done, and they can send that information back up with your, your testing results. Take your time. It's not a race. Uh, proctors will announce the time that are left. Oftentimes, there will be clocks within the room with you. And there's also a little countdown timer on the screen itself when you sit down for the computer-based exam, so you're fully aware of where you are with how much time you have left. And don't panic because others have finished the exam first. They could be writing a different exam than you. Again, like I said, not everybody is going to be there for the same exam for, that you're sitting for. They could be there for uh, a, a written part of a, uh, of a contractor's exam, something like that. So everybody's going to be getting up and leaving at different times. So after the exam, your paper-based exams are essentially scored. Again, it says it's going to take up to four weeks for you to get your results by email for that. Let's see, stand by here. All right, and once you complete the exam, you're going to get you're going to get a certification, like a paper-based cert certificate in the mail, along with a nice letter and congratulating you on your pass, and a nice little plastic. It looks like a credit card, uh, showing your LPI ID number and the latest certification that you just received. In order to check on the results for your exam, you can log into LPI.org. You can use your and then you'll need to use your LPI ID to check your exams or certificates that you have, which is also helpful for if you're going to apply for a job somewhere and they, they want to double check to see if you actually, say if you sat for the LPIC 2 and you passed it, and they want to verify that, if you provide your LPI ID on your, on your resume or your job application, they have the ability to check that as well. And you could check your postal address uh, to make sure that that's up to date so that if, for when they need to send you the paper, the, uh, paper certification that you get those, and verification codes for certificates, which you can also provide to a potential employer. And again, this goes back to where uh, an, a potential employer can verify your uh, um, your actual certification to make sure that you're that that you're telling the truth to them. So recertification. After five years, the LPI certificate becomes what is known as inactive. You're still LPI certified because basically what that boils down to is Linux. We all know. It changes, but it doesn't change a whole lot over time. So once you become Linux certified, you do know how to work with Linux. It's just that after a certain period of time, and that's five years by LPI, it basically means that there's been enough changes that you might want to go and maybe read up on the newer stuff to try to recertify. Your certification no longer serves as a base for higher certification. So if you sit for the LPIC 1, and that's the only one you've done for five years, and you go to try to sit for LPIC 2 after that five-year mark is up, you can sit for LPIC 2 if you want, and you can pass it, but you're not going to be considered LPIC 2 certified unless you go back and recertify your LPIC 1. The recommendation is recertifying every two and a half to three years. That's roughly about the time frame, maybe a little bit longer than that, when you could expect a new version of the exam to come out. That's not to say that you need to wait for the next version of the exam to come out and immediately go and retake it. You don't have to do that. Again, like I said, there's five years uh, between, uh, between you have to, when you have to get recertified 
or when your certification becomes inactive. So you got a little bit of, of a grace period there. A higher level certification extends all lower level certifications. So say an LPIC, so right here, an LPIC 2 certification extends your LPIC 1 certification. So let's say that you've only taken the LPIC 1 and it's been four years and 11 months. You go and you sit for the LPIC 2 exam before that five year mark hits and you pass it. Well, you're still good to go because your LPIC 2 is now good while your LPIC 1 has been extended because you got it done before that five year mark happened. Same goes for the LPIC 3, extending LPIC 1 and LPIC 2 certifications. In the event that you don't pass, sometimes this does happen, continue to learn and fill in knowledge gaps. The results email shows a percentage of correct answers that you got in each topic, but they cannot provide you with per question feedback on your exam. Obviously, that would break into yay, and people could use that to go and post exam, exam dumps and things like that. So it's basically just to look at the topic that the exam found you maybe to be slightly weak in, go back and look at the exam objectives on the website, and study up on those. Try some other commands out, do some different things, try some other experimentation, and see what you come up with. The second try is possible one week after the first try. Now, each additional try is possible 90 days after the subsequent attempts. So if you sit for LPIC 1, exam 101, you fail that, you can go again one, more, one week later to try again. If you fail the second time, you need to wait 90 days before you go for each subsequent attempt. The main goal, the main point behind that is that it probably wants to prove that they're not out to take your money. They want you to know the material. So they're giving you that longer period in between just to make sure that you understand the material. We just, we don't want you throwing your money away. We don't, we want to make sure that you know exactly what it is that you're being tested on. So if you have any further questions, obviously you can hit us up at lpi.org or you can post them to Caitlin here and give you just a second. And I am going to switch the screen to some other windows. Okay. And Caitlin, can you see this okay? Yep, absolutely. Okay, good. All right. So here's the main LPI website, and this is where you need to go to check for the particular exam sort certif of uh, certification topics that you're going to study. So you just go to certifications, and it's broken down by category. Here's the listing for essentials, and here are the ones for Linux professionals, broken down by individual exam itself. So let's go take a look at LPIC 1 for Linux administrators. And again, like I said, it's the 500 dash series. So we're on the 5.0 of the exam. So when you go to sit for an exam, make sure that you, and when you go to pay for your, your voucher for an exam, make sure that you're re requesting a voucher for 101 dash 500, 102 dash 500. Again, that should be the only thing that's on the market now, but just make sure uh, that's really going to be important if you go to buy a book or uh, buy some kind of online training material from a, a vendor that sells training for LPI based courses, make sure that it's, it's, it matches these particular numbers here so that you're getting the up-to-date information. And again, it just shows you some information we already covered, like the, valid, the validity is good for five years and some main topics, understand the architecture Linux system, install and maintain a Linux workstation, including X11 and set up as a network client. And what you really want to look for is down here. Again, the LPIC one is broken down into uh, two exams. You got the 101 and the 102. You don't have to take them in this order. You can do either one. It just You just have to pass both of them in order to be able to get LPIC 1 certified. So let's take a look at the view detailed exam objectives for 101. And again, when you're, whenever you're ready, you could click on this link here to purchase a, vou a voucher, and that'll help take you through the process for getting yourself set up with Pearson View, getting your, your ID registered, and all that good stuff so that you can get an exam, uh, get an exam scheduled. And each individual topic within an exam is broken up into uh, sub uh, into individual groupings, and each one has a weight to it. Now, the fun part the fun part that I've seen about the weights is it says weight two, and right here weight three. That's typically the, the amount of questions that you're going to find on a particular exam for this particular topic. So for topic 101.1, we have determine and configure hardware settings. The key knowledge areas being enable and disable integrated peripherals, 
differentiate between the various types of mass storage devices, determine hardware resources for devices, tools and utilities for listing various hardware information. An example they give you are LSUSB, LSPCI, et cetera. Tools and utilities to manipulate USB devices, conceptual understanding of SysFS, UDEV, and DBUS. And again, we had a partial listing of some of the commands and files that you would need to know about in order to get good scores within this particular topic. Now, all of the exams are, are broken down in this particular way where you're going to see a listing of the more commonly used commands. They're not going to get into details through here with particular options, such as like CP-A or CP-VAR, things like that for some commands. But it is expected that you would already have that knowledge prior to sitting for an exam. That's not to say that when it comes to a command, you need to understand and memorize every single option to a command within the man page. Just think about what would be the most commonly used options within a production working environment and focus on those and focus on the differences. And especially look at the options where if you're going to have a dash, uh, dash lowercase r and a dash capital R, make sure that you understand the differences between what those two options would do with that particular command in order to make sure that you don't get tripped up on, it, on an exam question. Uh, 101.2 is boot the system. So this involves working with dmessage, journal CTL on system D-based systems, understanding the difference, uh, the difference between BIOS and UEFI, what a bootloader is, what the kernel is. Now, all this is is just asking how the kernel plays into the actual boot process itself. There is going to be some overlap between individual topics, and I'll show you more about that here in a minute. The initial RAM file system, you need to understand what that is all about, what it's used for. The differences between classic init and system D and what system five init here is used for. But again, that goes back to the regular init. Upstart, uh, let's see right here. There, you need to have an, an awareness of upstart, but you do not need to obviously go into a whole lot of detail with upstart because nobody uses upstart anymore. Uh, again, that kind of pertains into looking at the topics that they have here and understanding what it is that they're looking for. So if it says an awareness of Upstart, you just need to know that it was created by Canonical. It was their way to do parallel service charts to the advent of the D. It was their quick way to try to replace in it. Uh, and that's essentially what you really need to know about it. 101.3, changing run levels and boot targets or shut down and reboot the system. So you need to understand the purpose of the Etsy init tab file when it came to the classic init system. Uh, understanding that systemd doesn't really use that so much anymore. Understanding what the shutdown command will do, not just the shutdown command itself, but the options that come with the shutdown command. How, how would you warn users that your system is about to be shut down? How would you uh, set the amount of time before a system would shut down? What, what option would you use to reboot a system when you use a shutdown command? Things like that. So those are certain types of options and uh, parameters that you would need to be aware of for a particular commands such as that one. And again, we have a knit here for changing run levels and boot targets. And again, we have a knit here for when it comes to booting the system. So like I said, there's going to be overlap. Uh, you need to know conceptually what a knit does. That is the first process on the system that uses it and how it worked with the init tab in order to set up a running environment, but also how to use a program like Telenit to change your run level that the init tab would set up on a classic system five init system. So again, we're looking at overlap here between these two particular topics. So once you start, once you start diving into a topic like a knit, go ahead and just, and just run with it. Go ahead and learn as much as you can about a knit so that once you get through it, you've already got enough knowledge, enough information lodged away in your mind that you can cover a vast majority of these topics here that involve a knit period. When it comes to system D and system, uh, the system control command, know how to use those commands, know how to use them on remote systems, know how to use uh, being able to start stop services, know how to use them to change a particular running target for a system. Uh, understand the, in the Etsy systemd directory and how it is different than the user, uh, the user slash live slash systemd directory. In case you don't know, all of your unit files for a typical systemd unit, when you get those from your Linux distribution, they're going to be installed here. If you need to make a change to how a particular service or a daemon runs on your system, you need to use something called a drop-in file and make that change here under slash Etsy slash systemd. The reason being is when a distribution vendor puts out a new package update, 
it's going to override the contents of this. But when systemd starts up, it's going to respect any changes that you make to your systemd unit files, fire those up from here, and then read the, the default vendor ones from there. So again, those are things that you need to be aware of when it comes to uh, looking at a, some of these topics a little bit deeper. The wall command, again, is used to notify other users on the system when you're about to make a change, like changing a run level, changing a target, or if you're going to use it to say, hey, we're going to do a reboot, things like that. We need to perform system maintenance. Uh, topic 102, Linux installation and package management. So this first part, design a hard disk layout. This is where you need to understand not necessarily the file system itself, like so ext, ext3, things like that, but you need to look at the file system hierarchy standard. You need to understand what the, the slash root file system is for, the slash bar file system, the slash boot file system. This is an important one. If you're not familiar with how newer workstations are being produced nowadays and how they boot, the EFI system partition, that's an important one. Needing to understand that it needs to use a FAT32 file system and why that is the case. Swap space, need to know how to do not just like your typical scenario where you have a swap partition, but understand how to work with a swap file as well. Typically, we don't really deal with swap, swap files on Linux, but uh, you're going to run through some, Linux, uh, some legacy systems from time to time where you may find that. Understand what, a, what the purpose of a mount point is, where you mount a device to a location, and the different types of partitionings. And partitions, we're going to, you're going, uh, I think it might be listed a little bit later, but understand partitions as far as using the commands of, such as parted, uh, fdisk, gdisk, understand the differences between them. Why would, if you're working with a GPT system, would you be able to use fdisk? No, you're going to have to use something like gdisk or parted. Uh, things are like that. So again, once you start getting to a particular topic, read up on it as much as you can within the man pages and look up some stuff online to kind of help give you some good guidance as to where to go. Installing a boot manager. Kenny, if I could interrupt for yes. one moment. I've had a couple of questions, and I know that you'll be touching um, on this a little bit uh, coming up, but if we can keep in mind, a few people are asking, um, they have taken the Linux Academy training course, for example, okay. um, but they're looking for additional materials and ones that you would uh, particularly recommend for practicing the 101 and the 102. Okay. Um, if there's any, a few quizzes or anything out there, um, even people that don't have access to training courses or whatnot, something that we could touch right. on later, perhaps. Yeah, yes, most definitely. I will definitely touch on that here in just a bit. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because with, when it comes to the topics, uh, everybody, I, I highly recommend that you go to the lpi.org website and the wiki.lpi.org website to look these topics up, up on your own because uh, really there's not going to be any way that we could try to cram all the details of this in just a, an hour and a half session. Uh, mainly, I just want to highlight some things that you want to look out for when it comes to this, but I'll, I'll go into some study uh, some st my recommendations anyway, my personal recommendations for studying materials here shortly in a bit. Um, uh, quickly running through here the, with installing a boot manager, knowing the difference between how Debian handles boot managers and how a Red Hat based distribution will handle a boot manager. Basically, that comes down to your file name for a legacy Grub installation. And also, you need to know how to work with Grub2. Grub2 is pretty much the de facto standard that's out there nowadays, mainly due to our EFI, our UEFI systems. So if you don't have a whole lot of experience working with Grub2 and using the default Grub file, I highly recommend just, just getting in there, digging at it, and, uh, and doing some study. Um, and again, I'll go over some resources here for things like that here shortly. Managing shared libraries. Now, this, this kind of highlights one of those fun things that I find with the LPI exams is that even though it only has a weight of one, you may only want it to uh, run into one question on exam involving this. It does cover quite, quite a broad range here. So when it comes to dealing with shared libraries, this is something that you really want to pay attention to as far as uh, how, how do shared libraries get worked with on a Linux system? What are the differences between the LDD command and the LD config command? And this particular environment variable that you may not see used much anymore, but on legacy systems, you may find it in use and why you would want to use it, say, with something like a job. Uh, we go to Debian package management. So the main one that I would focus on here is, yes, we have, like if you're an Ubuntu user, of course, you got sudo apt-get. Uh, but understand that there's apt-get and the newer version, which is apt without the dash get, and how to work with what, what the uh, apt-cache, what the file is that it pulls from in order to read that information. 
and especially this one right here, Depackage Reconfigure. If you're just coming over from a Red Hat based distribution, such as Red Hat, CentOS, Fedora, what have you, uh, chances are you may not have messed with Depackage Reconfigure a whole lot. And if that's the case, I would highly recommend setting up a Debian based system and trying these commands out, especially this one here, in order to get uh, a good understanding of this because uh, not going to say a whole lot about what you may find on exam, but uh, um, this is definitely one that I would pay attention to. RPM and YUM management, YUM package management. Um, there is, so nowadays on Fedora, and especially with Red Hat, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, we have DNF, which is supposed to have been faster. That's, uh, that's up for debate. Uh, just need to understand that DNF is essentially the same thing as YUM. It's supposed to be faster. It's a rewrite, and it uses the same configuration files and whatnot as, as, the, YUM, uh, as the YUM repos. Um, know how to work with the RPM2 CPIO command. If that's not something that you're familiar with on a Red Hat based system, you should probably go ahead and get your feet wet with that anyway, because it's just pretty handy. But go ahead and practice some exams where you're going to take an RPM file, dump it out to a CPIO archive, and how to send that out to uh, like a gzip tarball or something like that. Uh, Zipper is the command line interface used for, um, I'm sorry, the command line tool used for the SUSE, OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise distribution for dealing with their RPMs. Remember, SUSE uses RPM packages, but they're not the same exact RPM packages that you would find on a Fedora or a Red Hat based system. So know that difference and know that when it comes to SUSE, this is the command that you're going to use. Uh, the syntax from my experience is almost identical with YUM and DNF. There's some minor differences. But uh, typically, if you can do it with YUM, you can just about do it with Zipper as well. Linux has a virtualization guest. Uh, this is a fun topic, again, because it's one of those that's only a topic, uh, I'm sorry, a weight of one, but it covers a whole lot of information. So they're basically looking for understanding the, tech, the terminology and, and understanding a basic uh, grasp of the technology when it comes to a virtual machine. Now, this does not mean that you need to be a KVM kernel virtual machine wizard, need to know Zen inside of out, inside and out, VMware, things like that. Basically, they're wanting to know if you understand what a virtual machine is, how create, uh, basically what does it constitute, such as you have a description file with KVM, it's going to be a, an XML file that describes how this machine is set up, and you're going to have your hard disk image file. It's going to, they're going to want to understand, uh, want you to understand that there is a difference between a a uh, pre-allocated disk image file and one that's using something like a copy on write file mechanism that grows as you add more data to that particular file. So again, these are concepts. They're not looking for specific commands or things like that within this topic. They just need, they just need you to understand the, the basic terminology when it comes to a virtual machine. Same thing when it comes to a container. Containers are all the rage right now in basically the entire IT world. So we got Docker, we got Kubernetes, we've got System DN spawn. We've got uh, Rocket. We got you know everybody and their grandmother's got a new container technology nowadays. Um, again, not getting tested on specific ones. That comes for higher level certifications. They just want you to understand what a container is, what differentiates a, differentiates a container from a virtual machine, and live migrations or being able to use those for high availability things like that. So, uh, looking for higher level concepts when it comes to Linux container. Kind of application container, uh, same, same concept. Guest drivers, why would you use a guest driver in a virtual machine as opposed to just using a fully virtualized uh, virtual machine? SSH host keys, which comes in handy for being able to remote into your virtual machine. Or if you have a remote host on a cloud-based system, being able, like an AWS system or, or uh, you know, any kind of IaaS cloud system, using an SSH host key to access your cloud-based images that you may have. Uh, the Dbus machine ID, and all honesty, it's not one I've seen in the real world used a whole lot, but when it comes to virtualization, it does make sense. So I would recommend reading up on that. And if you have any questions about what, what do you do to fix a Dbus machine ID, you essentially reboot the host and let, let the system do it on its own. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, GNU and Unix commands. Now, this is, now there's a bunch of overlap here. So we got a uh, way to four process text streams using streams of filters, number line, SHA, SUM, SED, HEAD, again, weight of two, uh, perform basic file management, four. So all these are going to be a whole bunch, and same thing right here, down here with T and X arcs, four. 
create, monitor, kill process. So if you are familiar with the bash command line, I would suggest going through all of these listings of commands that are here and try to know them as much as possible and get really, really good at them. Being able to, uh, being able to pipe together some pretty good commands. I'm not saying you need to write a whole, whole script all in one line, but understand the very uh, the commonly used options for these commands. Get a lot of good practice with them because there's so much overlap between them all that you may see the same command pop up in five or six different topics, asking for a different way to use it, asking for a different option. So keep that in mind when it comes to anything involving a bash command, especially with those fill in the blank questions. So that's something that you also need to keep in mind. Uh, create monitoring killing process. This is pretty cool. It used to be you only got got uh, uh, tested on screen. Now we're also doing TMUX. Remember, they're both multiplexers when it comes with dealing a uh, dealing with a remote shell on a remote system. Modify process execution again. It's going into the to the bash. But uh, regular expressions and working with said egrep, fgrep, and regrep. So I highly recommend if you're kind of weak on regular expressions. The first stop I would recommend is going to manual page seven of regex and working through the examples that are in there, working with the different tools, read these man pages for egrep and fgrep, understand why there's different ones, what each one does leaving rep, and get pretty comfortable with set if you're not comfortable with set already, as far as being able to not only the common thing we use it for search and replacing, but also how to do particular types of numbered modifications of a file when you're looking for a specific line or something like that, being able to print the information that you changed out to a different file, things like that was said. So look for some of those more slightly advanced use cases for said and get comfortable with those. The VI text editor, basic file editing. So basically they're going to want to know that, uh, want to make sure that you know how to work with VI. Um, used to be there, uh, there was a lot more coverage when it comes to Nano. Now it's just basically they want you to have an awareness that it exists. Same with Emacs. When it comes to my advice for this particular topic, most people just use straight up Vim. So if you're really proficient with Vim, most of those commands and options are identical with VI. So you should be pretty much good to go. Uh, something else to look out for is the editor environment variable, knowing how to change that, say, if your system is set up to use Nano by default, changing this environment variable to where if you open up a configuration file in a bash prompt, then you could use your VI or Vim text editor uh, in order to use that text editor instead. Um, something else, I don't see listed here. If you're not very comfortable with VI or Vim, the one command I highly recommend that you play around with is Vim Tutor, V-I-M-T-U-T-O-R. It's built, uh, when you install Vim, it comes with it. It has something kind of like a little game mode that you, you go through various chapters and I would say once you get to about chapter four or five is about the extent of the knowledge that the LPI would test you on out of that particular utility. So, but it would, it helps give you good practice on navigating with Vim, trying out different window panes with it, making modifications, running commands from within Vim, uh, all kinds of good stuff. So if you've never heard of Vim Tutor or if, or if you feel like you're weak on VI or slash or Vim, uh, I highly recommend playing around Vim Tutor at least until chapter four, until you feel really comfortable with that tool and utility. Down here, we're getting into the partitions of file systems. Again, before I was talking about, you're just basically looking at the file system hierarchy standard. Now you're looking at the tools that it takes to actually create a partition and the different types of file systems that you would put on those partitions. Again, there's a, there's a difference between FDisk and GDisk. FDisk does not handle GPT style partition disk. GDisk does. Parted, on the other hand, can handle both NBR style partition disk and GPT style partition disk. If anything I said makes no sense to you, uh, I highly recommend that you get familiar with GPT and the difference between that and the old style MBR, because not only is that really important for today's modern environment, today's modern service, and today's modern workstations, it does play into when you sit for the exam as well, because these are these are pretty important topics uh, that because we're basically at a point of transition with going from one style to another that we all need to get comfortable with as technicians in general. The particular file systems that you're looking at, XFAT, VFAT, the difference between the two, how XFAT can let you store files that are larger than two gigs in size, two, uh, sorry, two gigs in size. VFAT is what you're going to find on an ESP partition. XFS, uh, Red Hat's pushing XFS like crazy right now. It's a uh, pretty fast file system, but you need to understand that 
it uses its own separate tool set to make the file system and to work with that file system, as opposed to the extended two, extended three, and extended four file systems. So if you're comfortable working with extended two, three, and four, which most Linux distributions put those out by default, and you've never messed with XFS before, go ahead and create a separate, excuse me, create a separate partition of, of XFS and get used to using like the XFS debug, XFS repair, things like that, the separate tools that come with XFS by themselves. And on a uh, different type of, uh, like say Debian or whatever, there's a different package that you have to install. I think it's XFS util or something like that, that you need to install in order to get those commands. Uh, what else? There's basic features of ButterFS, um, sub volumes. You don't need to know how to create these. You just need to know that ButterFS gives you the option for multi-device file systems, compression and sub volumes. Uh, ButterFS is still kind of a slightly controversial file system for stability. So they're basically looking for concepts, not how to actually get into the nuts and bolts of creating a ButterFS file system. Uh, maintaining integrity. Uh, again, like I said before, XFS has its own separate set of tool sets, whereas the extended file systems have their own, have, have the same ones that they share between them all. So understand the differences and how to work with each one. Mounting and unmounting file systems. Uh, block ID and LS block, knowing that you can use LS block to also get the block ID. Uh, changing file permissions and ownership, Chmod, UMass, Chone group. These are the, again, basic, uh, basic bash commands that you need to know how to work with. Know how to work with symbolic as well as numerical permission sets. Understand those pretty well. Linking and uh, between, a, you know, know that there's difference between a, a hard link and a soft link and you know, can a, can a hard link traverse file systems? No, it can't. Well, why is that? Well, it's because of inode numbers. Again, that's, you know, not super deep, but there is some essential knowledge that you need to have when it comes to linking files and directories between different file systems. And then find system files and, file, and place the files in the correct location. So when it comes to the find command, uh, basically you need to know how to work with, Define command to, to look for different types of files, different types of directories, uh, permission sets that are on those, and know how to use the dash exec option to act on what you find. Like if you need to remove something, if you need to move something, uh, know the command syntax for working with find to act on a specific, specific criteria for a file or a folder, and then also know the dash exec for what to do once the find command locates that stuff. Understanding how locate and update DB work work together, update db creates or updates the database that the locate command uses in order to actually search for files and folders. And here is your update db.conf file that controls what directories it gets searched and what does not. Uh, type, which is built into bash, lets you know if something is a built-in command for bash. It lets you know if it's a binary, if it's a script, if it's a function, uh, that kind of thing. The differences between the which and the where is command. So stuff like that you need to be, uh, you don't need to get super down into the details with, but you do need to understand what the differences are between the two. Now I'm going to quickly jump over to 102 just to kind of show you again some of the overlap. Shells and shell scripting. So basically when it comes to this, if you know how the shell environment is set up, and again, note that between a Debian and a Red Hat based system, you're not going to have all these files together. Um, typically under a Debian based system, this is all you're going to have, the .bash RC. Whereas a Red Hat based distribution will often break it out into uh, dot, I'm sorry, uh, dot bash underscore profile along with dot bash RC. Sometimes this is optional. SUSE sometimes uses this one. So know what these files are and how they pertain to some of the different distributions. Know the order in which these files get called up when you start a login shell or a non login shell on a system. Know how to create a bash function, know how to create a bash alias know how to work with your different environment variables and how to set and unset those. And also use the set and unset commands to create different options for your particular bash environment. If all that sounds, sounds brand new to you, um, I highly recommend going ahead and getting into that because even though it has, this particular single topic has a weight of four, you may find that there are going to be some scripting options later on that may recall some of this information. Again, you're gonna have some overlap. So customize and write simple shell scripts. Uh, there are plenty of tutorials on the internet. I'm not going to get into a whole lot here. So know how to create a basic shell script along with doing different types of branching. Uh, install and configure X11. So if you've been paying attention to the way the Linux world has been working here lately, when it comes to the graphical desktop, most systems are now going 
over to Wayland. Even Debian 10, the newest stable release, has been using Wayland by default, which is not a server. It is a protocol, which is completely different than what X11 is. X11 is, is an entire server software suite that has a whole bunch of tools, utilities that come with it. So you need to understand X11 architecture. And I'm going to show you something here. I don't know if it's posted yet or not, but uh, hopefully, hopefully that'll help you out with that. Uh, again, you need to understand awareness of, of Wayland. Know that it is a protocol. It's the newer replacement Rex 11. It is meant to be a more secure, easier to develop replacement. Even a lot of the X11 developers have left the X project or they're working on both X and Wayland at the same time. So you need to understand these environment variables and these commands and how they play into an X11 system. You need to know that on most newer installations of X11, you may not even find an xorg.conf file because that gets created on the fly by utilities such as systemd and the newer versions of, of X11. But if you need to specify a certain layout or a certain setting, then you're going to need to create these x.org.conf files. And if you need to create them here, I'm sorry, right here under xorg.conf.d, or you need to create a blanket one for an entire system, know the difference between those two locations and the file namings between, uh, why would you name a file one way in here and a different way here? So that's something else you need to keep aware of. Graphical desktops, basically they want to make sure that you know the differences between KDE, GNOME, and XFCE, that they exist. Uh, you basically need to understand that the different technologies that they're built on, like KDE is built on QT, GNOME is on GTK, so is XFCE. X11, you know, you're basically looking at Tom's Windows Manager, uh, XDMCP, which is basically, the, we're now we're getting into remote protocols such as RDP, SPIES, and VNC, and XDMCP for accessing a graphical desktop remotely. It's only a weight of one, but it's not one of those topics that kind of covers a broad area. So you don't need to get down into the super duper nuts and bolts of these particular technologies, but you should have an awareness of, of them and what each individual one is, what, what their purpose is. Like, you know, why would you use VNC as opposed to Spice? That kind of thing. Uh, RDP, why would you use RDP? Where does it come from? What, what TCP port does it use? That kind of thing. Accessibility, now we're getting into uh, sticky repeat keys, on-screen keyboard, screen magnifier, the braille display, the screen reader. It's not listed on here, but basically Orca, the utility that is used on GTK desktops to kind of do screen reading for you, things like that. So you need to know that the Linux desktops have the ability to make modifications for those who have certain type of hearing impairments, side impairments, uh, things like that, some of the technologies that you would use to enable those features. So you could look, poke around on your, your, administrative ta uh, your administrative panels for KDE and GNOME to find those tools and you know, just basically get a feel for them. Manage users and group accounts and related system files. Now these are all local groups and users. These aren't getting into things like LDAP or uh, Kerberos or things like that. So this is all local user accounts on the system. Know the differences between these files, know their permissions. They, knowing the permissions of these files is important and why those permissions are set a certain way know how to modify a password for a user, change the age of a password, set an account inactivity period, things like that, creating new accounts, modifying usernames for accounts. Like say if somebody gets married and they need to change their last name, how would you do that with the user mod command? Things like that. So uh, get, get uh, quite comfortable when it comes to making modifications to a local user, user account. Know the difference between at and, and the, uh, the at command and the cron allow, I'm sorry, the cron, commands where cron you can use that to set up a repeated task that's going to continuously happen over a schedule or at is going to run a command at a specific time just once and that's it a one and done and how to work with those particular queues and set up security for those if you're not familiar with system ctl and system d run how you can use system d timer units to create essentially a cron replacement and that replacement all with and the under the umbrella of system D. So if you're not familiar with that, I highly recommend going ahead and getting your feet wet with uh, working on system D, uh, system D timer units because the syntax is a bit differently. Uh, it's done a bit different than a cron tab or an at file, and it uses a slightly different format when it comes to specifying time. So definitely look through the main pages on that. Localization, internationalization, uh, it's a pretty big one as far as uh, as far as the weight is concerned. Three. So understanding what the LC and the LC all environment variables are there for, how to change the time zone on a system, how to change the system locale, such as the character encoding for a particular system, uh, using time date CTL, TZ select, how to convert 
from one file character encoding into another character encoding with the ICO and V command. Uh, understanding the UTF-8 and the ISO 8859 ASCII and Unicode, understanding the, you don't need to know the, the nitty gritty of those, but you need to understand what those particular codes are there for and basically what their differences are. Central system services, again, we got a little bit of overlap here. We got NTP, local time, time zone, so that kind of goes a little bit into locale, but this is more in, uh, more within the, the, uh, the bit about maintaining a system time. So NTP date, crony C, understand that this is supposed to be a replacement for the classic NTP D, know how to set up a system to be able to talk to pool.ntp.org for NTP time protocol. Um, how to set your, let's see, where's that? How to set your local, your, uh, local time zone using the files that are found under user share zone info. System logging, basically this boils down to know how to work with syslog, syslog ng, uh, system dcat, and journal ctl. Um, not going to do a whole lot of detail here because it, I mean, it is a way to four, but uh, I would, if you're not familiar with uh, logging facilities and things like that, I highly recommend you go ahead and study up on those and know how to work with the journal CTL command, right, there it is, for system D and how to pull up different types of messages from a journal, such as kernel messages, such as service messages, looking for an owner of something that fired up a service or an application, uh, looking for a time time variation, like if you're looking for a particular time window for when something fired and when something did not fire. So know those types of concepts when it comes to working with journal CTL. MTA basics, basically know how to set up a uh, um, email on a local system to get forwarded to somebody else on a local system. That's basically what it boils down to. And that, in that includes using uh, postfix and send mail. XM is listed on here. I've never seen anybody use it in the wild. I've never seen it on the exam but there it's listed anyway. At least know that it, it is that it is an MTA, but you do not need to know how to set up postfix and send mail as like a full-on uh, enterprise grade, enterprise level mail server. All they really want to look, to look at here is that you know how to set up a local system to receive email for other, like say if something were sent to the root user, how to set up an alias so it can get forwarded to another user on the same system and that you can use Postfix or SendMail to do that, and how would you do that? That's basically all it is. So don't get too caught up in the details here with this particular topic. They're just looking for local mail forwarding. Cups is kind of a big one. Um, you know, supposedly we're get, we have been the paperless society since, what, the mid-1990s now, according to what the government told us back then. But uh, printing is still alive and well, keeps on kicking. So know how to work with the Cups server how to work with the, uh, the LPD legacy interface command, such as uh, LPR for, uh, and LPRM for removing, removing print jobs, LPQ for looking at a queue. Uh, they are setting up a low print server, and you don't have to get to a printer. There are software PDF printers that you can set up. So if you can't get your hands on a hardware printer, just set up a localized PDF printer just, just to test out with, just so you can set, send print jobs to a test PDF printer and that way you don't have to worry about wasting any paper or any electricity, and you still get a chance to mess around with the various cups commands and adding and removing a uh, brand new printer. Networking fundamentals. So you need to know what this file is. You don't need to know everything in this file, but you need to know what this file is and why we have it. You need to know the difference between IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, so basically you need to know what those different types of IP addresses look like, the, you know, the quad four as opposed to the IP version six. And I would... Uh, I don't see it. Know what the local host address looks like on IPv4 and know what the local host IP address looks like for IPv version 6. Submitting, you're going to have to do slightly small amount of subnet calculations, nothing crazy. They're not looking for uh, Cisco wizards here, but you do need to understand how to read CIDR notation and how to at least translate from a CIDR notation to like a 255.255.252.0, something like that or whatever. Know the difference between TCP, UDP, and ICMP. Um, basically, you know, if you're looking for secure communications, which one would you use? Uh, if you just need to send a message, you don't care if it gets there or not. If you're just testing to see if something is live, just know the difference between those and why you would use them. Ports list. I get asked this quite a bit. What network ports do I need to know to have memorized for the LPIC1 exam? They're listed right there. All of these ports. Know what each of these ports do and what services they tie to. So if you don't know how to look that up, well, your Linux system already comes with that cheat sheet right there. 
So you can just grab Etsy services for port 123 to find out what, what particular service it goes for, 162, 389, things like that. So you have a good study, uh, study resource right there available on your local system. Persistent network configuration. This is getting into working with the host name files, nsswitch.conf file, resolve.conf for your local DNS resolutions. Uh, knowing how to work with the network management command line interface command. Um, I'm sorry, that's all I gotta say about that one. Uh, network management command line interface command, it's, it's sometimes it's a bear unto itself. Uh, sometimes the, uh, I found examples that have been written by the developers of it that don't actually work when you go to use a command. Um, so I would try it out on both a Debian-based system and a Red Hat-based dist distribution just to try to get a feel for some, sometimes they package up differences. I, I don't know, it's just from what I've seen. But, uh, but get comfortable first basically setting up a static IP and setting up DNS, setting up your gateway, and setting up a, um, and setting up a system for a, a DHCP uh, configuration using NMCLI. That's basically what you're looking for when it comes to working with the NMCLI command on the LPIC one. And if up, if down, bringing up your interface, bring it back down again. Uh, hostname CTL for changing your local hostname as opposed to working with the, the hostname file, uh, things like that. Base network troubleshooting, uh, know the difference, know, know how to work with the IP, IP command, uh, SS command now, let's see, yeah, here we go. So we used to use the netstat command a lot. That's basically been deprecated and has been replaced by SS. If you're comfortable with the netstat command, chances are you're already good to go with the SS command. The cool thing about the system, or I think it's system services or system sockets command, I forgot what the abbreviation stands for, but essentially the same options that work with netstat will work with SS with some minor differences, but just you know, make sure you check out the man pages to look those up. Trace route for IPv4, trace route six for IPv6. Basically, if it's looking for an IPv6 command, it's basically the same as the IPv4 with the six appended to the end of it. So that kind of thing. This configure client side DNS. Now we're getting back into some overlap again. SE host, SE resolve.conf, and SE uh, switch.conf file. So know how, know how to uh, configure those files, what their layouts look like, and why they're set up a certain way. Uh, know how to use the dig command to query deep remote DNS servers and the get at command to also query uh, remote servers for different types of information. Security administrative tasks, again, we're going back to define command again. So where we need to use the find command for checking out different types of, uh, of file permissions, uh, looking for different you know, sticky bit, uh, the set UID bit, things like that. The passwd command for modifying a, uh, um, a user's password, uh, change, and map, you don't have to be a super duper black hat hacker to use Nmap. All they want to know is, can you find what other systems may be available on your local network? Can you use it to ping another system just, just to make sure that you can actually connect to something else on your local network? That's it. They're not looking at, can you use Nmap to set up a local web server so you can use, set up a honeypot? They're, they're not looking for anything that crazy. Uh, again, we see the netstat command again. Know what sudo is for and how you would work with the sudoers file. Noted what the SU command is and the different options that you would use to create an interactive shell and a non-interactive shell. And of course, you limit for setting up different types of file limits within your system and uh, for per user and for system-wide things like that. Set post security. Again, we're kind of still tying into stuff uh, from the previous topic. Know how to control what services can, can start and stop on a system. Um, how to control system D sockets. Uh, init tab again for you know, how many, do, do you really need a, a graphical desktop environment on a system that's just going to be a web server and it's going to sit away in a closet, how to modify the net tab to only run a particular, uh, a particular run level just to kind of keep the amount of services down. Uh, TCP wrappers, uh, we don't really see a whole lot of people talk about TCP wrappers anymore, but on legacy systems, they're still used rather heavily. So know how to work with TCP wrappers with the host that allow and host out deny files. Securing data with, with encryption. Again, we're going back to working with SSH keys again. So if you've already got a good handle on working with SSH keys to access remote systems, then you should already understand how to work with different types of encryption mechanisms and how it, you know, what you would do with a private key as opposed to a public key. And how to also uh, take a notice here. This is your SSH keys that are dealing with your local user account. And these are SSH keys that deal with your system as a whole. So know why you would want to change something for the system as a whole, and as opposed to what you would do with an individual user account. Uh, SSH known host, 
So once you know, once you get logged into a system, it knows how to work with that particular remote or know how to identify a system based on a remote key. And of course, GPG for encrypting a file, um, basically for uh, you know just so you can give a key to somebody else that that you want them to decrypt a file that you send them through an email or something like that. And they can use the public key that you send them to decrypt the same file that you sent them. Uh, things like that. We're not getting into super crazy stuff with it, but basically just looking at how to encrypt, decrypt a file based on a shared public key using private keys that the two users would have. Uh, so again, that's a lot of information. I know that's like a complete waterfall of stuff that these exams cover. Um, so I recommend that if any of this is unfamiliar to you, then I highly recommend practice, practice, practice. That is basically what it comes down to. Now, uh, as Caitlin mentioned, some of you guys have gone through Linux Academy. Uh, there are other institutions that are also available out there that, uh, uh, that do teaching for LPI. Uh, when I was at Linux Academy, I did the Linux Essentials course, and they'll pick one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, some of my friends still work there, and I know they're working on the newer versions of the, uh, uh, of the LPIC2 courses, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but if, if you've gone through them, uh, there's other resources such as, uh, such as Udemy. I don't know how well Udemy keeps up with stuff. A lot of that stuff is based on the contractor basis. Um, again, there are books that are available out there, such as Amazon and, uh, and your local books that they can order for you. But when it comes to getting a book, make sure that you're getting a book for the exact version of the exam that you're looking for. And I highly recommend just, uh, just really look at the topics that are listed on the wiki.lpi.org and the main LPI website. Look for stuff that you're not familiar with. Go through the man pages and go through some examples that you find and, and just, just practice as much as you can. There's, there's nothing in this world, no amount of training, that is ever going to be a good replacement for practice. Because once you get something down to like a muscle memory or once you fully understand the ins and outs of a particular topic, then it just becomes like a second nature to you. And, you know, a lot of people look for brain dumps, things like that. And, you know, that's just, that's just not helpful to the industry. It's not helpful to us. It's just, uh, it, it's just better to just understand what it is that you're doing. Because when it comes to a crunch time scenario, knowing how something works is going to do you a whole lot better than just, did I guess C or B? Because this is what the brain dump said to do. Um, that being said, uh, Linux Professional Institute, we are working on some stuff. We are working on our own learning materials that uh, the cool thing is, it's coming from us. So when you go to like a third party vendor and like, okay, well, this is what, from my experience, this is what I found that they, that they test on. So I'm going to provide a whole bunch of training on that. Uh, with Linux Professional Institute, we look at the topics that we promote that we want people to know about. And we go ahead and we take those and we write lessons for those topics to kind of, to basically give you a really good solid starting point, not, not exhaustive, but a starting point for what it is that we are looking for when it comes to a particular topic that you would get tested on. Um, this site, learning.lpi.org, it's, we, we're still working on this. The, I just want you to understand that this is, uh, this is still in development. Um, but we have, let's see here, da, 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 if you can find the right link. Uh, let's see, look, okay, so we click on the learning materials link here, which is the same thing up here at the top. We have the essentials, the Linux essentials, course material already available showing you that is it is the current version of 1.6. So if you click on a particular uh, particular learning material group or book as you wish, you can actually look at the topic itself the same way that we have it laid out on the website. And you can drill down even further and look up individual lessons. And here we give you a breakdown of just some practical tips and how how you would probably use this in the real world. And along with some explanation, and towards the bottom, we have explorational exercises. Let's see, here we go. We have guided exercises, which are based on what you have just read in the study materials to kind of give you uh, some experience to work with some of this stuff. And then we have what we call our explorational exercises, which is stuff that we, we ask you to do that you may not have read about in the, in the learning material lesson, but it's basically to prompt you to go look into the man page and to try different things out just to see how you would answer that particular problem. So it's a way to kind of get you to do some research on your own. And of course we follow that up with a summary and we don't leave you hanging. After the summary, we provide our version of the answers of what works when we run these things. Uh, when it comes to explorational, your mileage may vary because there's always more than one way to do something within Linux. But these are some, uh, these are some paths that you can try when it comes to some of the explorational exercises. 
And as you saw a moment ago, we also have some stuff for LPIC 1, which is what we are discussing today. This one is not yet complete. We are still, it is still under active heavy development. Uh, I still got some stuff that I'm working on getting some in myself. Uh, but again, you can pick out a particular topic. Let's say, let's look at boot the system. And if you, once you click on a topic, it's the exact same layout of what you would see on the LPI learning site. I'm sorry, the LPI uh, wiki page or the main website. And then you can drill down over here on the right to do an actual lesson. And we cover what it is. You know, if it's only one of one, some, some lessons we have, uh, most of the lessons are just one lesson but there's some that have parts one and parts two. We don't go anywhere beyond part two. We try to keep everything within, within two parts to, to keep it from becoming too overwhelming. So again, the, these are based off of the topics that we have listed on the main website, but you can go through and see how, uh, uh, just to kind of give you a good uh, a jump start on how to work with, with, with these commands, some of the different options that you can use with them. Um, and basically how to, to use them in a real world setting to, to get useful information out of them. And again, the same thing is with the Linux Essentials. Once you get through all this material, we have guided exercises, exploration exercises, which again is meant to take you beyond what you've read about and, and the learning material to get you to think on your own a little bit, to force you into that mode of practice and exploration. And again, the summary and, the, uh, and what we provide for answers. Um, these are free. These don't cost you a thing. This does not require any kind of registration to a provider whatsoever to use this stuff. Um, we continuously update them. We actually have a mailing list that we that we provide for people if they find mistakes or if they find or if they have ideas for things uh, that we use to help help guide us with uh, with what goes on within the real world on the typical production environment to kind of help align what we write here to better fit what somebody may find in their in their job. So that's the good thing is that, again, this, this is not, this is, this is completely free. We're not charging for any of this. Uh, you don't have to use this. This is not the de facto standard of, uh, of study, you know, study materials period. It's just meant to guide you as a starting point to get you going into what we test on. Um, and again, they're not exhaustive. Uh, if there's something listed in a topic, we try to, we do our best to recover it. But there may be options that, are not that are not listed in a learning material that you may get tested on. So, like I said, don't use these as the only study material that you have. Use these as a starting point. And like I've said before, and I, I preach this from the mountaintops, nothing in this world will ever be actual practical experience and, and just, just plain practice on working with these commands and trying different things out with them. Um, so again, there's there's this is freely available to you. We are still actively developing it. We're still actively working on it. Uh, other exams will follow. Some changes to this particular exam set, LPIC 1, is, is we still have those in the, in the pipeline right now. Uh, we don't have both exams fully covered yet. The main point was to get 101 out first, and we're still working on 102. Uh, we hope to have that out within the next few months or so. Um, we're working pretty hard on that. Uh, but again, there's other vendors such as Linux Academy and, and Udemy. And, and I think actually a cloud guru just recently bought Linux Academy, so I don't know how that's going to affect things. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do for Linux training, but there's, there's plenty of other vendors out there in the sea that uh, provide uh, LPI training for the LPI certifications. Um, and again, there are books. And it, you know, there's, I've actually seen some good YouTube videos of some people who, who put out some really detailed information about a, uh, just a single, I mean, they may not cover a whole exam really good, but they do cover particular topics extremely well. So you, know, you can pick and choose out of that as well. Um, that again, that doesn't cost you anything except just you know your time and and, and the internet bandwidth to use those. Uh, you do not necessarily need to run out and and purchase any training or any kind of courseware in order to pass an LPI exam. That's that's not the goal. The goal is to just to test to make sure that you know the material to get you certified to prove to your uh, to prove to your your em employers and, and to the world that you have some level of mastery over the skills of the Linux operating system to make you a more viable candidate uh, within the job market. And just, you know, just, just for your own edification as well, because I mean, a lot of us work on Linux, not just because it pays, but because I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's just some of us really geek out pretty hard working with this and uh, we enjoy it. And we, uh, we, we'd like to continue that for other people as well. Um, got a few more minutes left here. So I'm just going to stop my mouth for a moment. And <laughs> if we have any further questions from anybody, please uh, let us know. Uh, 
Caitlin, do we have right now? Well, thanks, Kenny. Um, we don't have any questions. I've answered uh, quite a few of them throughout. Thank you again for providing all of this um, information. A lot of questions are coming from additional practice resources. And what would you suggest um, that people are able to actually go and get more of that hands-on, um, maybe tutorials or, or, or things like that um, from the 101 and the 102? So if you have any suggestions for that, that would be that would be great. Yeah. So, all right. Um, if you have, uh, if, if you have a computer that, you know, if you don't want to install Linux on your, on your entire computer, you don't have to do that. You can use something like VirtualBox or uh, any other type of virtualization software just to set up a local VM and, uh, and just use that just, just, just to, uh, just to beat up on and to practice different things with, um, there, there, I've seen some exam dump websites out there. Uh, I, for multiple reasons, avoid them because they're they're just a they're terrible and b you're going to get terrible information out of it and it's not it's just not going to help you. So I highly recommend setting up like a virtual machine if you have a spare machine in your house to set up. Um, you know, use those. Uh, if if you're uh, if you have a if you have a cloud provider that you work with that you don't want to install install anything locally, you can set up a uh, a cloud instance of a Linux installation. Um, AWS provides their own versions of a, uh, it's basically a rebuild of, of CentOS Linux, if I'm not mistaken, with a bunch of modifications to it, uh, just to make it work better on their platform. But nonetheless, you can use those to practice many of the same commands here in order to get up and running to get a good feel for things. Um, let's see what else. As far as uh, a lot of the books that are available out there, they have their own practice exam software that comes with it, like on a CD or a DVD, that you can use to kind of get a feel for how an exam environment uh, is what an exam environment is like just to kind of get you into that mindset. And a lot of those books will also provide at the end of each section, each chapter, they will provide a whole bunch of question and answer type things and scenarios where they say, run this particular command, or you need to do this particular thing. What commands would you use to accomplish that? And, and they encourage you to try those out. Um, so again, if, if you're, even if you're on windows, uh, you can use a virtual box. It's, it's free. It doesn't cost you a dime. Um, it's just your time and your space on your hard drive. You can uh, you can install that and download any version of Linux uh, to uh, uh, to try different things out. If you're looking for some other free, now let's see. I think it's wiki.arch.org. If I can spell today. Nope. Let's see. Let's try this. Arch Wiki. My bad. Uh, wiki.archlinux.org is another good free resource. I, um, I don't use Arch Linux, but uh, I will say this. Their documentation out of all the Linux distributions is just, it's just the best hands down. So if you're, looking, if you're looking for a particular topic, let's say, let's just do X11. All right. Well, here, Xorg. They have this super duper long extremely detailed article on x11 alone that will walk you through so many different aspects of it now when it comes to the lpic one exam you do not need to know all of this but the stuff that you would get tested on does exist within documents or within uh, articles such as this so another good free resource is uh wiki.archlinux.org um there's just like i said the uh documentation for that particular distribution is phenomenal but because we're vendor, uh, we're vendor neutral. We don't we don't exactly tie ourselves to a particular distribution. That's great because you can use any Linux distributions resources in order to better understand a particular topic. And I just like this one because they they have uh, they got a really good reputation for having really reliable information. And I've used it quite a bit. And it's just it, they've done a really good job with with the quality and the content of the material that they publish for uh, any particular topic within Linux. So that's just another free, uh, freely available resource that's really handy. You can use to study on your own time, um, you know, just, just to practice with. Thanks so much. Um, does the System D topic, is it thoroughly covered in LPIC 1? Because um, they don't seem um, to see much of it mentioned in LPIC 2. It, uh, because it is a local system, uh, is, is more it pertains more to the local system because it's what you use to start and stop your local services. It actually handles your user sessions. Um, 
your your uh, your local host name information. It it does. SystemD is basically the umbrella for all the things that goes on within a Linux within a Linux computer, an individual Linux computer. So you're going to see it covered extensively for LPIC one as opposed to LPIC two. Now remember with LPIC two, we're looking more for Linux within a networked environment. So you're gonna need to know more about the different types of network servers that you would use. System D pertains more to what you're going to do on your local system in order to get different things up and running. So yes, yeah, system D is going to be much more heavily emphasized within LPIC one. Okay. Um, have you, can you go into um, EduSum to practice, practice exams? So LPI we have on our, um, on our LinkedIn page. Um, it costs about $26, um, I believe, that one, one of our attendees has mentioned. Um, EduSum, you said? Yeah, but do we know if EduSum is actually reliable for this purpose? Uh, I would I, say I yes. I've never heard of them. Okay. Yeah. I've never heard of them, so I don't know. Uh, Okay. But yeah. If, if it's, if it's somebody that we partner with, then, then I'd feel fine with that because we, uh, we, we don't just, when it comes to LPI partnering with people and, and Caitlin can attest to this, it's just, you know, not, er not everybody can just show up to the party and be like, I'm gonna be a partner. And we're like, okay, yeah, here, you're a partner. It doesn't work like that. It's, nah, there's some correct. vetting. Yeah. There, there's some vetting that takes place. There is some, uh, are you actually helpful to the open source community? Do you actually provide, you know, value beyond what you're trying to do? So we don't, we, we make sure we don't just get fly by night type people. We make sure that we get those that are reliable and, uh, um, and, and, and understand what, what the main goal of LPI is. So. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, and, and one last question here, where can I find uh, a free ISO of Red Hat distribution? Okay. So when it comes to Red Hat, uh, just kind of clarify things a little bit. Red Hat is an enterprise distribution that you have to, Technically, you can get their stuff for free, but they only offer the individual packages. If you want, uh, if you want support, then you have to pay them. Now, for a little while there, they were offering free developer accounts to where you would, you would go to developer.redhat.org, register a new Red Hat account, and you would have access to a free installation, a single installation only, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you can use that to register against their update servers so that you could pull you, you can pull all their you know their yum information down specifically from red hat themselves um let's take a look here i it's been a couple of years i'm not sure if they still offer this i guess redhat.com.org yeah what the, okay it's developers.redhat okay so they changed it again it's developers.redhat.com now and da, 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 linux Okay, so it looks like they, they may still do this. Uh, it's worth checking out to see if they still offer this. But again, you, uh, you could download from there, but you have to register with them first. You can't just go to the FTP website like, like we used to be able to back in the old days and just pull an ISO down from there. However, uh, the flip side to that is you can use CentOS, which is the Community Enterprise Operating System. It's a rebuild of the freely available material from Red Hat. And this used to stand alone on its own, but prior to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 coming out, Red Hat has actually gone out and bought them. So this is actually, the CentOS project is now actually owned by Red Hat. So the good thing about that is that there's a little bit more of a closer relationship. So the quality is supposed to be more in line with what you would find within a Red Hat installation. Uh, but again, you when it comes to support and things like that, you're on your own because it's community-based. You can't get official support from Red Hat for this. But what you could do on a Red Hat-based system, 99.9% .9 you can do on a CentOS system. I, I say not 100% because in my experience, uh, Red Hat does a much, much better job of QAing, Q, doing some quality assurance of their packages than CentOS does. So you may find that you could run a command and get exactly what you're looking for with results on a Red Hat installation. You do the same thing on a CentOS installation, something may not work right. It's rare, but I've actually run into it enough in my experience that I, I to stop using it. Um, but if you don't want to go through the developers.redhat.com avenue to get an ISO from them, the CentOS project is a viable alternative. And like I said, 99.9%, .9%, it's, it's close 
to what you get with, with the current Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate that. Um, I think that it's all, um, there's one question here. Is the voucher offered online video training websites available on LPIC exam? Hmm. For video training? Yes. Um, Linux Professional Institute doesn't offer any video training, but companies like Linux Academy does. And they used to, when I worked at Linux Academy, they offered voucher discounts that you had to use with a particular one-time use code. Uh, that was over a year ago. I don't know if they do that anymore. You'll have to check with whatever vendor it is that you uh, maybe subscribe to. Um, I don't know if all of them do that. And again, I don't even know if Linux Academy does that anymore or not. But just, uh, just check with whoever your training provider is to see if they offer discount voucher codes. Okay, great. And one last question. Uh, which distribution is uh, kind of the best for beginners that you would that's, suggest? That's a really loaded question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. I would say, in my, my honest opinion, um, and again, I, I, you know, if somebody sees me in public, I may get egg for this. But for the absolute, absolute beginner, uh, I would go with, with this plain Ubuntu. Um, if if even that's a little bit more complicated than, than Linux Mint, which is partially built on Ubuntu and partially built on Debian, is pretty good. But uh, I would say Ubuntu, for somebody who's brand spanking new to Linux, is a good starting point. And again, once you start down the path of Linux, there is a difference between those that come out of the Debian project, such as Ubuntu, and those that come out of the Red Hat project, such as Red Hat, CentOS, and Fedora. So one, if you want to get more into the realm of uh, studying Linux in general and stuff like for the Linux Professional Institute where we cover both aspects. Once you get comfortable with one, say, say Ubuntu, then install like a virtual machine or something of Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, just so you can get to understand the differences with how it is constructed and how the, uh, the package management is where, really where the differences come into play, knowing the differences between how to install, update, and remove software with RPM-based distributions as opposed to those with Debian-based dist uh, Debian distributions. Okay, great. That's all the time we have um, today, everyone. So thank you very much, Kenny, for donating your time. I um, really appreciate it. Um, I will be sending out an email with a brief evaluation, the presentation slides, um, and the recording. So if you do have any follow-up questions, please let me know and I will pass them along. Um, at this time, thank you all for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.